Why do bad things happen to good people? What is a good person supposed to do when bad things do happen to them? And, well, what I guess I'm trying to say is... Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Lucky for us, a certain school of philosophers have spent a lot of time thinking about these questions. So you can call me Ezekiel. These are the Stoics. Let's jump in! As with most philosophies, the origins of Stoicism can be traced back to Socrates. A key component of Socrates' ethics was that bad things cannot happen to good people. Now, that's not because good people are immune to tragedy. After all, Socrates was himself sentenced to death, and he certainly saw himself as a good person. The reason why bad things cannot happen to good men is that bad external events are not enough to cause a man harm. For harm to truly occur, a man must allow external events to bother him. In other words, if a man experiences tragedy, he can still choose to be happy. This, by the way, is one of the reasons why Socrates was so accepting of his death sentence. He just didn't let it bother him. This idea spawned the Cynic school of philosophy, who took this concept and absolutely ran with it. You see, cynicism means the philosophy of the dog. This name started as an insult, but the Cynics seemed to like it, and adopted it as their official name. Insult or not, the name was accurate. The Cynics believed that since external circumstances shouldn't affect you, there's no real point in having an advanced civilization. It would be far better to just live in nature, like dogs. Thus, the Cynics lived lives of voluntary poverty and asceticism. The most famous member of the school was Diogenes. However, the Cynic lifestyle was not attractive to most Greeks, so a new, more palatable school would grow out of it. This new school would be Stoicism. Stoicism got its name from the porch, or Stoa, that its founder Zeno was famous for lecturing from. This made him the philosopher of the porch, or the Stoic. Zeno's teachings would inspire a great many philosophers to follow in this Stoic tradition, so we'll narrow our focus down to his two most famous devotees, Marcus Aurelius, the Emperor of Rome, and the Greek slave Epictetus. Note how these men came from extreme ends of ancient Roman society. This is a testament to the universal appeal of Stoic philosophy. An emperor, a slave, and everyone in between can find wisdom in its teachings. Now, Epictetus never wrote anything down himself. Instead, we have records of his lectures written by a student, Arian. These compilations are the Discourses and the Enchiridion, or the Manual. The Enchiridion seems to be based on Discourses, but also features other content, which suggests that there are more records of Epictetus that we've lost. Luckily, Marcus Aurelius is much simpler and more complete. We have his entire work of Stoic philosophy written in his own hand, Meditations. So now that we understand our philosophers, let's take a look at their philosophy. The Stoics maintain that although things happen according to fate, this depends not on the movement of the planets, but on the principles and logic of natural causality. This school concedes to us the freedom to choose our own lives. Once the choice is made, however, the Stoics warn that the subsequent sequence of events cannot be altered. With regard to practical matters, they maintain that popular ideas of good and bad are wrong. Many people who appear to be in dire circumstances are actually happy, provided they deal with their situation bravely. Others, regardless of how many possessions they have, are miserable, because they don't know how to use the gifts of fortune wisely. That is how the great Roman historian Tacitus described the Stoic philosophy. As the description implies, the Stoics have a full system of philosophy, from metaphysics to aesthetics, but we'll focus on their most interesting area of thought, ethics. Like most other Greek philosophers, the Stoics thought that happiness, eudaimonia, was the goal of ethics, but they have a rather strange approach to achieving that happiness. As opposed to focusing on virtue and positive action, as a philosopher like Aristotle would have taught, the Stoics instead focus on suffering, and how it's a barrier to happiness. They thought that by overcoming or being able to bear suffering, men could find happiness. But how can someone be happy when they're suffering, or when tragedy strikes? What is man to do when he's being tortured, starved, or dealing with the loss of a loved one? The Stoics thought about this long and hard, and here's their solution. The Enchiridion begins by saying, Of things, some are in our power, and others are not. This can be considered the central axiom of Stoic ethics. Suffering comes from attaching yourself to that which you cannot control. So if a loved one dies, the pain you feel is not the result of them dying, but of you wanting them to live and them dying anyway. By attaching your happiness to something you cannot control, the life of another, you'll only make yourself miserable. So since it's impossible to prevent other men from dying, one should protect himself by detaching his happiness from other lives. Learn to view other men as just that, other men and don't make any of them special to you. Marcus Aurelius responded to the death of his own twin sons by saying, One man prays, how I may not lose my little child. But you must pray, how I may not be afraid to lose him. But what if a bad thing happens to you? 
is it not reasonable to experience suffering then? Not at all. As Marcus Aurelius again puts it, Poor me, because this happened to me. No. Say rather, lucky me, because though this has happened to me, I'm still happy, neither broken by present circumstance nor afraid for the future, because the same thing could have happened to anyone, but not everyone could have remained content. Remember from now on, whenever something tends to make you unhappy, draw on this principle. This is no misfortune, but bearing with it bravely is a blessing. In essence, a Stoic should claim ownership over nothing. The Entroidian says, never say about anything, I have lost it, but say I have restored it. Is your child dead? It has been restored. Is your wife dead? She has been restored. Has your estate been taken from you? Has not then this also been restored? This even goes as far as to your own person. You are a bit of soul carrying around a dead body, as Epictetus used to say. This body is not yours. Nothing is. You have simply borrowed it, and must soon give it back. A major part of Stoic ethics is apathy, lack of emotion. But apathy is a funny word, like atheism or anarchy. It only describes the absence of something. One might be tempted to ask a Stoic, if you don't care about what happens to you, why study ethics, action at all? Why not simply sit down and let your body die? After all, you wouldn't care if you did die. The Stoic answer to that is duty. In the absence of emotions or desires to guide one's actions, one should allow duty to guide their actions instead. By the way, this is the very same sort of duty morality that Immanuel Kant would soon base his system around to combat the Enlightenment. I once heard duty morality described like this. A duty morality is any morality which separates virtues from values, or actions from rewards. If this is true, then it's the perfect system for a Stoic to determine his actions. After all, a Stoic must avoid having desires or values. Duty ethics allow him to act without them. However, the Stoics do not believe in pure duty. In other words, a Stoic doesn't follow his duty because it's his duty, he only follows it because he believes that, in the end, it'll make him happy. This has the effect of making it difficult to determine whether Stoic ethics are egoistic or altruistic. On the one hand, duty means that they operate on a fundamentally altruistic code of ethics. On the other hand, their end goal is still personal happiness. A bit of a contradiction, but one that's characteristic of ancient Greek philosophy. Even the most altruistic Greek philosophers could not avoid paying lip service to the importance of personal happiness. But that's a problem which future non-Greek philosophers wouldn't suffer from. But that's a topic for a future video, because this has been the philosophy of Stoicism. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it, leaving a comment, subscribing to the channel, and hitting the notification bell. And if you'd like to help us make more videos like this one, you can do so by supporting us through Patreon, Subscribestar, becoming a channel member, or PayPal. Links to all of which can be found below. Up next, do you remember that time we covered how 10,000 Greek mercenaries had to fight their way out of the middle of the Persian Empire and marched all the way back to Greece? Yeah, well, that's not the only time in history something like that has happened. I'll see you then.